All right, welcome to another IAEI News Live. My name is Thomas Dimitrovich, and today we're going to talk about the AFCI requirements found in 210.12. We're going to continue our discussion from last week, and we're going to focus on what's in the 2020 code, how it got there, and a little bit more on the language that's in the NEC for arc fault circuit interrupter protection. And you know what? It all starts now. All right, welcome back. All right, so AFCIs, arc fault circuit interrupters, I tell you a very uh, important topic. Hopefully you got a chance to watch the program last week because we dug into the standard. We, we dug into understanding some fundamentals about what a branch feeder is versus a combination type. Uh, we talked a little bit about the OBC outlet branch circuit, arc fault circuit interrupter. Um, I believe and so and, and we dug into the testing so I started to get into the uh, the requirements that you find in the National Electrical Code and quite frankly we ran out of time so but I wanted to make sure I did that justice and this will um, at least close the chapter so far for 210.12 uh, in my mind for at least this introductory fundamentals of arc fault circuit interrupter protection. All right, so keep in mind uh, to, uh, to check out the video from, from last, uh, last week. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing those numbers go up. I want you to hit I want you to hit that subscribe button. It's free. I want you to hit that um, the thumbs up and hit the bell so and the bell will just let you know that when we post and when we go live uh, regardless of what uh sessions we're putting a lot of materials up there if you take a look at the IEI's youtube site it's really growing i'm pretty i'm very happy with um with how that's progressing and we plan to do a lot more in the future so you're going to want to subscribe to this channel if you are not already a part of it all right so 210.12 of the arc uh, of uh, the National Electrical Code has uh, been around. And if you've watched last week, remember, it's been there since 1999. But this um, these requirements that are in the National Electrical Code for arc fault circuit operator is all about they're all about protecting the entire branch circuit and the connected cord. So you got to keep that in mind when you read the requirements in 210.12. The concept here, the issue that we see in the fire statistics, an electrical fire can start anywhere along that circuit, whether it's behind the wall or on this side of the receptacle in, in, an, apply, in, an, in, a, in an appliance, say that four times real fast, in an appliance, in the appliance's connected cord, in the NM wire that's behind the wall, all the ways back to the branch circuit over current protective device, which is the molded case circuit breaker. So we want to provide that protection of that com of the complete branch circuit and the connected cores. And that's an important thing to distinguish because a lot of people think that the molded case circuit breaker that is in your panel board is there to protect those conductors that um, power the vacuum sweeper or power your lamps. Uh, those conductors that are that are con that are basically connected to an appliance that are plugged into the receptacle are not designed to be protected by the multi case circuit breaker that's back there in your panel board and 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 you say well what is the protection article 240 tells us we have to protect all conductors well the protection of those conductors are a part of the listing of the appliance and you have to use those products as per their listing. You're not going to run extension cords under under carpets unless you see an extension cord listed and rated for running under a carpet. They don't exist, in, to my knowledge. Um, 
you have to uh, think about the uh, appliances are not designed to be used uh, in a bathtub, right? Um, you know, you don't take a toaster and put it in the bathtub. That's why we have GSCI protection and things like that. Um, and, and, and you can't misuse products, is my point. When you do, bad things happen. The AFCIs and GFCIs are there to, to help you. It's your last, last resort of protection. So, arc fault circuit interrupters protect the entire branch circuit and connected cords. Very important piece of this puzzle. We already said last week that uh, the AFCIs were introduced in the National Electrical Code in NFPA 70 in 1999. To, pro the, to provide the branch circuit supplying 125 volt single phase 15 to 20 amp receptacle outlets in dwelling unit bedrooms. All it said in the initial introduction with an effective date of January 1st, 2002. Why did they have the January 1st, 2002? Because only two manufacturers were on the market with an AFCI product and the industry needed some more time to bring solutions. So they gave three years. Um, there was no provisions for a receptacle. In fact, there, was, there were no receptacle type AFCIs on the market at that time. The only, again, there were only two manufacturers and it was a branch feeder AFCI devices that were on the market by two manufacturers. Now, I'm sure other manufacturers had, had theirs you know, in the wings waiting. I'm sure they were, they were there, but uh, we, we put the enforcement date out there um, to facilitate bringing solutions to the table. And so, and then in the 2002 version, they removed the receptacle and they said, no, it's not just about a receptacle. It's not like a GFCI product. Uh, it's an AFCI. It's about protecting any of those outlets because it's all of that infrastructure wire that goes to the bedroom, whether it be for receptacles or for lighting, all of that goes into the um importance of protecting the entire branch circuit. Remember, it's that journey of the conductor from when it leaves the circuit breaker in your panel board all the way up there to whichever room. Why do we pick rooms? Why did we pick the bedroom? And I said this last time, it was the area with least exposure to a number of types of solutions that might uh, be in conflict with the technology of arc fault circuit interrupters. It was a neutral area where you could get agreement by the code making panel to make this a requirement. And it was the beginning of the journey and the journey from the get go was to protect all 15 and 20 amp branch circuits in a residential home. Because they know that that journey of that conductor from the panel board all the way up to that bedroom probably going to be right next to the say, another conductor that's possibly going to the living room or another conductor that's going to a hallway. The circuit that goes to the bedroom is not different. It's not more susceptible than any other. It's just a way for us to identify, make it clear for inspectors and installers to understand which circuits are required to have AFCI. The intent wasn't to keep expanding room by room by room. The intent was to, to go to the whole house uh, at some point. We're still not there. So they removed the word receptacle and they just said all outlets in the dwelling unit bedrooms. They wanted to, again, protect the entire branch circuit and there was no, still no provisions for the receptacle type AFCI because they didn't exist yet. All right, 2005, branch circuits supplying 125 volts, single phase, 15 amp and 20 amp outlets in dwelling unit bedrooms, still there. The branch feeder, so in 2005 is when we started to phase out the branch feeder type AFCI. Now this is why, so this is part of the reason, and you're gonna see another reason why it's important to understand what a branch feeder, branch feeder AFCI type is when we get to the 2014 code. But 2005, we're, we're phasing out the branch feeder AFCIs for the introduction of the combination type AFCI. My personal opinion is I hate that word combination. A lot of people mistakenly think combination AFCI is AFCI, GFCI. No, 
combination type AFCI, and we said this, if you don't know what it is, and if you're in the perception that it is AFCI and GFCI, go back and watch last week's program. Because last week's program, I explained the difference between a branch feeder AFCI and a combination type AFCI. It is one test in the UL 1699 standard to detect a five amp series arc in SPT2 cord. That's the only thing the combination type AFCI brings you is a five amp arc fault protection of a connected cord that doesn't have an equipment grounding conductor. And we had a new exception. So this in the 2005 is the introduction of requirements that would permit the use of a receptacle type AFCI. Now, the new exception said AFCIs are permitted to be within six foot of the origin of the branch circuit protected by a metal raceway or cable with a metallic sheath. So this is, you have a molded case circuit breaker at the source, okay? You have a molded case circuit breaker up there in your panel board. You have a home run circuit that is in conduit in some sort of raceway, um, what did they say? protected by a metal raceway or a cable in with a metallic sheath. So you can do, use MC cable or you can use uh, a raceway <clears throat> for that home run circuit, six foot, up to six foot maximum. And then here we have where it says an AFCI is permitted. Now, there were public inputs and comments that suggested an outlet branch circuit type AFCI as being that device required or permitted here. But the code panel elected to use the generic term AFCI. And their reasoning was that any type of AFCI could be located at this location in the circuit. Now, I, I don't know how I would put a circuit breaker in a box there. Could I do that? You could. I, 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 I don't know, but that's the way they went. I, at, the, at that time, they said, look, if we just use the generic term AFCI being permitted, you can use an outlet branch circuit type AFCI, you can use a branch feeder uh, AFCI, you could use the combination type AFCI up until, again, you can use the branch feeder up until January 1st, uh, 2020 or 2008, uh, but uh, because they're phasing that out to the combination type. So they just use the word AFCI. Uh, and, and I show a receptacle there because I don't, personally, I don't, I don't know what else you would put there, in my opinion. So that was the big change in the 2005 edition, that six-foot rule, the introduction of an option outside of a molded case, outside of a circuit breaker, an arc fault circuit interrupter, circuit breaker type at the origin of the branch circuit. So now, in 2008, we, we saw expansion beyond uh, just bedrooms. So now we have, um, again, leveraging the same fire statistics in reality. Uh, when you see a home uh, that, is, uh, that, that is taken because of an electrical fire, um, it's the electrical problem is doesn't say, well, I'm going to have a problem in this room, but not that room. It really doesn't matter. Uh, damaged conductors, there's, um, in fact, um, I'll, a little bit later, if we have some time, I want to make sure I get through this, I'll go and show you some of the found problems that are documented by NEMA, National Electrical Manufacturers Association, on their AFCISafety.org. They do have a presentation where they have documented found problems with uh, because of the application of arc fault circuit interrupters. So we have expansion to family rooms, living rooms, parlors, libraries, dens, sunrooms, rec rooms, or similar rooms. Then we have an exception. They modified the exception. Remember, the, um, the, the previous exception had six foot when it's in a raceway or MC cable. They removed the six foot and they said, well, <laughs> what makes the difference? You're protecting the home run circuit. So if it's 20 foot, uh, you've got a 20 foot in condo and raceway. And, and, and you know where that's used a lot, probably I would say in um, Chicago area, in the Illinois area where they require pipe and wire. So uh, they don't, if you have, uh, you don't have NMY, you wouldn't put NMY in a raceway. You would 
you know, pull single conductors in a raceway. If you're familiar with the wiring methods that uh, they they do up there in, in Charlie Chicago in Chicago. And and now um, the the remember the language that said the AFC is permitted at that at that first outlet. Now they said the combination type AFC is permitted at that. Uh, at that first outlet. Remember, they removed the six foot rule and you have that properly protected home run circuit. Uh, which and they expanded it. They said RMC, EMC, EMT, or IMC, EMT, steel armored cable, type AC cable, meeting the requirements of 250.118. So that that exception, so we had the exception in the 2005, which then brought some more options on the table. That same exception is still there. Although instead of just a generic AFCI, it's a combination type AFCI. They removed the six foot, gave you all of these other options that you can use to, to, to protect that home run circuit. And then they add an exception for fire alarm circuits when that home run is properly protected. RMC, IMC, EMT, steel armored cable. They use the same language that's up there in this exception. And they said, look, if it's a fire alarm circuit, you don't have to put AFCI protection on it. Um, and then again, it's a fire alarm circuit. They're worried about compatibility. All right. And then uh, also, in, in, so, then, so then we move three years into the next cycle. You still have the branch circuits, 15 and 20 amp circuits in the dwelling unit locations that were listed so that there wasn't any added, there weren't any added rooms or subtracted rooms uh, to that list that was uh, that was uh, introduced in 2008. You have now the first recognition of an outlet branch circuit type AFCI, an OBC AFCI. 2011, that first receptacle outlet uh, that, remember from the previous one, they added that RMC, IMC, EMT, steel armor cable, and it was supposed to be a, a combination type AFCI. They added now that it has to be an outlet branch circuit type AFCI. And they added a new ex exception uh, when you have that home run in concrete. Okay, so, so now you have two exceptions in the National Electrical Code that specifically provide options outside of a circuit breaker a type AFCI at the origin of the branch circuit, you can use an outlet type AFCI as long as we protect that home run circuit. Remember, the, the goal here is protection. You already have complete protection of, of the home run and every wire in the, in the home with one single device in the panel board. If we're going to introduce other methods, we need to make sure that we don't reduce the level of protection that you're currently afforded. We don't want to go backwards, right? We can add additional protection, but we don't want to remove the current level of protection afforded by existing language. So we want to maintain that. So the recognition of an outlet branch circuit type AFCI, because remember, an outlet branch circuit AFCI device looks is like it's a, it's a little bit like GFCI. GFCIs look downstream. An outlet type branch circuit device gives you the full capabilities of what's in that circuit breaker looking downstream. It just can't see behind it for things like a parallel arc fault. Uh, it can see behind it for a series arc fault because that series fault is that current. Remember, in a series arcing fault, the current is staying in the path of that's the good you have a conductor that is damaged say a hot conductor is damaged and you have a series arc so it's a series arc it's staying in the path the op that current that that arcing signature will pass through the obc and the obc can recognize that fault current that's bad that might be coming from a damaged conductor behind it and it can open and Take the load off. It can't clear, it can't, it can't pro technically, it can't provide protection of a con damaged conductor behind it because it's behind it, right? It can stop the flow of most current in the circuit. And I say most current. 
because some current will still flow through the damaged conductor because there are LEDs that are on an OBC AFCI that tells you that it tripped. How do you power the OB how do you power those LEDs from that damaged conductor that's behind it? But it's a low current. So, um, so what the OBC can do is detect a fault behind it, open, remove the load, the majority of the current flowing through that damaged conductor. And that's what it does. So it, that's that series arc detection that the OBC has within it. Now, you have a thermal, now if that series arc behind it goes ballistic, then the OBC can't do anything for you. Um, so, but that, that's just the way that technology operates and functions, and, and that's recognized. So you have to understand the limitations and capabilities of each of these devices. A brand, the combination type AFCI circuit breaker can't look behind it either, right? So in fact, uh, you don't want it to look behind it because you don't want to see, you don't want your device tripping because of a fault in your neighbor's house, right? So, or on another circuit. So you just want the protection of that branch circuit, not something behind it from a breaker's perspective. But once you get down to the red, that receptacle, the code making panel and the provisions, okay, of protection of that home run circuit is important. That's why we have the requirements to protect that home run circuit when you can use these OBC or AFCI type devices when you properly protect the home run circuit. EMT, IMC, e, uh, RMC, steel armored cable, type AC meeting requirements of 250.118, etc. or concrete, put that stuff in concrete. Okay, so now 210.12 added a, um, a new exception with expanded home run protection of concrete, we already said that, right? So those are the two methods. Now the OBC is specifically called out in 2011. Also, uh, they added 210.12b for branch circuit extensions or modifications. So this is when you can use a, uh, if you have an existing home and you're replacing and you're modifying the, uh, the circuits in existing homes, you can use an outlet type AFCI without regard for protection of that home run circuit. Why did we do that? Why did panel two do that? I wasn't on panel two in 2011. Uh, listed type com listed combination type AFCI located at the origin of the brand circuit. So remember, everything here is my opinion. Okay, I do not speak on the behalf of NFPA. I do not speak on behalf of uh, of the uh, of uh, the code making panel two, uh, NEMA, Eaton, IAEI. Um, what you hear come out of here was originated up here. All right. So, in my opinion. When the 2011 code, I was sitting around the room listening to the debates and hearing the discussions. The, um, they, they wanted AFCI protection for existing homes. If you required a circuit breaker, and let's say it's a fuse panel in a residential home, that's an older home, very likely it could be still be a fuse panel. If you then said, if you modify a branch circuit, now you're required to have AFCI circuit breaker protection, you're mandating that they update the service. And, and once you start getting into that world, remember, this, uh, at this time, most of the AFCIs still had ground fault protection of equipment within them. And if you go back to last week, you'll understand why did the, most of the branch feeder type AFCIs have GFP to pass that one test, that series arc test in NM wire, that five amp test, series arc fault protection of NM wire for the branch feeder. So most of them had ground fault protection of equipment. You couldn't live with shared neutrals. And, and, and back in the day when they had knob and tube uh, or just two conductor uh, uh, why are they, they twisted neutrals together like mad. So you would be introducing a lot of troubleshooting uh, of those types of issues. Not that they're not, not that it's not good to, I, to, to fix all those problems and, 
And, you know, and maybe there's a, an argument that could be made that, you know, uh, the reasons we had burning homes was because of the problems in these existing homes that these things would make you fix. They did not want to. What they didn't want is people to not update their services because of the fear of the expense, not of the AFCI itself, but the expense of fixing all of the sins of the father or the sins of the uh, the electricians and and the 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 life and, and gr uh, aging of the infrastructure from the past. OK, and the wiring practices that were that were uh, acceptable in the past, which aren't acceptable today. So. They didn't they did not want to deter updating your services. So so this is why they wrote this the way they did. And they gave you two options and they gave you the option to don't worry about that home run circuit. But these outlet brand circuit type AFCIs still would recognize problems downstream, even if you put it at the first outlet. Right. So. We sort of just. Move the problem a little bit further downstream. I don't know that we really addressed or they addressed the actual concerns. But this is the first time you see a requirement in the code for brand circuit extensions or modifications. Any of those receptacles, any of those, uh, any of any type of those uh, uh, that work being done uh, in the code is um, is now would now be mandated. I wanted to grab my 2011 code book because uh, I don't have my glasses. All right, well, this is gonna be tough, but I'm gonna read this. Uh, dwelling units in any area specified where branch circuit wiring is modified, replaced, or extended, the branch circuit shall be protected by one of the following. So there wasn't any provisions for the, um, which we'll see some, this will get some love in later editions of the code, but this is the first introduction to that. Now, this also spawned a change over in a different article, 406, 406.4D4, which talks about replacements. Remember, 406.4D talks about, I think, well, you have to look at them. There's, there's replacements of GFCIs, there's replacements of receptacles, there's uh, the tamper resistance up there. So they said, look, if you have a receptacle and you're replacing a receptacle in any of these areas that are required to be AFCI protected, then you have options. A listed outlet brand circuit type uh, receptacle, a receptacle protected by a listed uh, outlet brand circuit type arc fault circuit type receptacle, a receptacle protected by a listed combination type arc fault circuit interrupter type circuit breaker. And the effective date was January 1st, 2014. Why did they do that? Well, because OBCs didn't exist. I mean, there were listings, but you couldn't find them on the market. So remember 2011, important one for the OBC. It's now specifically called out um, and, um, and as an option um, and you see Wiring device manufacturers starting to bring these solutions to them. They've got them listed, and now they're going to start bringing them to uh, to the table. All right, so now we move into the 14, and this is a very important um, time in the life of a B a AFCIs and the National Electrical Code. And I want to spend some time here because it's this. There was a lot of research done. There was um, a lot of data brought to the table around the requirements to try to provide more options on the table with regard to the OBC AFCI device. Okay, so now we have six options in the 14 code. Okay, six options in the 14 code. And the reason I say this is an important one is because these options haven't changed since. They're in the 2020 code. They'll be in the 2023 code. They haven't changed. And it's important to understand the origin to see where some of this information and why they did what they did on Code Making Panel 2. All right, so option one is the combination type AFCI at the origin of the branch circuit. Is that new? No. Option one has been a requirement in the code 
man, outside of it being a combination type, remember if that, if, if it didn't say combination type, if it said branch feeder was permitted, then I can go back to the 1999 code, which was uh, required in 2002. So I could say uh, a structure built in 2002 to the 2002 code would have an AFCI at the origin of the branch circuit. Now, remember the code cycle that went from branch feeder to combination type, that was 2005, right? So the five code now said combination type AFCI uh, with, an, with an enforcement date of 2008. So any structure built 2008 and later code to the, to the National Electrical Code um, uh, uh, 2008 edition or later would, would meet option number one out of the shoots. That's been around, not new, it's there. Options two to four. And I know, let me just address this one down here. Options five and six, those were those two exceptions that permitted the OBC. Remember, IMC, EMT, XYZ, LMNOP, uh, protection of that home run circuit, any length, you had, and concrete, that was five and six. Those were moved from exceptions to positive language, which is kind of cool, right? I mean, that's the way it should have been. So now you have option one, which has been around, options five and six, which has been around. When was the first exception that went in? If I'm not mistaken, the first exception was the 11 code. I got to go back. I, I want to make sure I'm right on that. Was it the 11 code? Hold on. It was the 11 code. No was the eight code. No, it was the 2005. 2005 was the very first exception that was introduced. This is one of those two. So that exception uh, was introduced in the 05 code, it, and, and then they added to it over the few cycles, and now it's moved to positive text. Now, options two through four. These are three methods, um, relatively new. Option two is the branch feeder type AFCI. Remember I said earlier, why do you need to know the difference between a branch feeder? Because it is an option where you can put a branch feeder type AFCI, forget about protecting the home run circuit for any reason. Why? Because the branch feeder gives you what? And if you go back to last week's, you'll understand. A branch feeder AFCI gives you a parallel arc protection for the, that's the high energy arc detection for the home run circuit, as long as you want it to be, and it gives you that five amp low energy arc detection, that series arc detection in NM wire. So you have complete protection with the uh, branch feeder type AFCI for that NM wire that's between the, the branch circuit AFCI, which is in the panel board that at the beginning of the branch circuit, all the way out there the, to that first receptacle outlet. And, and quite frankly, you have uh, double protection. You have the OBC AFCI looking at all of that installed wiring and this branch feeder, which will give you that same level of protection. The OBC, what does it get you that the branch feeder does not provide, that the combination type does? That five amp low energy arc in SPT2 cords that you'll see on appliances. That's what the OBC brings to the table in this option. Now, the question is, can you still buy a branch feeder type AFCI? I know you're thinking that. Uh, and honestly, um, good question. I, I don't think, I think, I know at some point Canada still recognized them, so we made a branch feeder type AFCI for Canada, but I think Canada's moved over to the, uh, uh, to the combination type as well. Uh, so I don't know that you can really get a branch feeder type AFCI. They're just not out there. Now, could you order one? Do we still supply one? We could probably make you one if you wanted one. But if you're going to put a breaker in there, you're going to use option one. You're not really going to use option two. Just doesn't, wouldn't make sense. Financially, wouldn't make sense. Technically, makes every side all the sense in the world. But financially, economically, you're going to go with option one. So these two, 
options three and four. Supplemental arc fault circuit interrupter at the origin of the branch circuit. So the supplemental arc protection circuit breaker is what I believe how they actually call it out. 210.12, a listed supplemental arc protection circuit breaker. A SAP. <laughs> supplemental arc protection circuit breaker, not a supplemental ASCI. So you really should fix that. And I am going to do that because I can. Supplemental arc protection, supplemental arc protection circuit breaker at the origin of the branch circuit with restrictions, okay? And, and I'm gonna go over the restrictions. The restrictions are consistent for, for three and four, and I'm going to help you understand where the, the distances came from and understand what those restrictions are. But I'm not gonna get into it right now. <clears throat> so, now the problem with item three, a supplemental arc protection circuit breaker doesn't exist, nor does the standard exist to make it. So uh, can, you, uh, can you do option three? Not really. I mean, this was introduced in 2014 and there is no supplemental arc protection circuit breaker. Here we are in 2020, there still is no supplemental arc protection circuit breaker. Is there a standard for a supplemental arc protection circuit breaker? No. Is it going to be in the 2023 code cycle? Absolutely, a supplemental arc protection circuit breaker will be in the next code revision. Uh, does not exist, standard does not exist. So if I wanted to make one today, I couldn't. Option four, molded case circuit breaker at the original, and I'll read to you what option four says. A listed outlet branch circuit type arc fault circuit interrupter installed at the first outlet in the branch circuit in combination with a listed branch circuit overcurrent protective device where all the following conditions are met. So when it says a, in combination with a listed branch circuit over current protective device, they're talking about a multi case circuit breaker located in the panel board. All right, and that same list of options, are, which I'm gonna get to. <coughs> Excuse me. They work as a pair to protect that home run circuit. There is one manufacturer who makes a pair that can meet the requirements of 210.12A4. And that is a product that has a device that is listed as a UL489 device and it is tested with an OBC AFCI downstream to meet the requirements of UL1699. So it has the exact same protection level for the entire brand circuit. So it is an option on the table. And we already talked about those two exceptions. So let us move on. The other thing that the 14 code did was they expanded to dormitory units, 15 and 20 amp here circuits, branch circuits, uh, outlets installed in dormitory unit bedrooms, living rooms, hallways, closets, and similar rooms. Uh, and again, it's any one of those options listed in A1 through 6 that we just talked about. Then we had brand protection of the home run circuit in the 14 code. Oh, another thing we expanded to was kitchens in the 14 code. Forgot about that. We expanded to kitchens in the 14 code. So, I've got to do that. Control. This is what we call kitchens. Kitchens was added. So we added kitchens 
and we added four devices. And what did that do? Or devices. I knew I missed. I knew I missed that. We missed. We 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 added or panel two added or devices. What 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 was that? That would be important. How this impacts you. Let's say that you have a circuit that controls the outside lights and the receptacle and the light switch, the, the device. It turns those lights on and off is in a hallway. Parlors, libraries, dens, bedrooms, summers, closets, hallways. Because that device, that light switch is in a hallway, that circuit would have to be on an AFCI device protection. People be afforded AFCI protection, which would mean you're picking up those outside lights and that circuit on AFCIs. So if you have lights on the outside, you can say, well, those don't need to be AFCI protected. Where's the light switch? Is the, if the light switch is on the outside, then I would say you're true. That's true. But if that light switch is in a hallway, if it is in the kitchen, if it is in um, any of these rooms, a family room, a dining room, a living room, a parlor, a library, a den, if it's in the bedroom, a sunroom, if that light switch is in any of these devices, any of these uh, areas, you're going to have to AFCI protect it, even though that circuit goes outside or goes to another room that's not listed on here. If that light switch is in that room, then you pick up that circuit. Uh, and then we added kitchens. And what was the debate in the 14 code with kitchens? Oh boy, compatibility with GSCIs. Right. And GFCIs are required to be readily accessible. So how do I handle that? Well, how do I handle I handle AFCIs being readily accessible? How do I handle uh, um, uh, GFCIs? Remember, uh, in 210.12, that's the other thing we added. Oh, boy, we got uh, we just. AFCIs must be readily, readily accessible. OK. So if I have it in the panel board, fine. If it's in the OBC type AFCI, it has to be readily accessible. If it's a receptacle, I'll let GFCIs had to be readily accessible. So then the question was, okay, I've got a uh, I've got a refrigerator in my kitchen, and the receptacle for the refrigerator is within six feet, so it has to be GFCI protected, and it has to be AFCI protected. How do I get that done? And how you get that done is possibly putting AFGF in the circuit breaker or putting arc fault in the circuit breaker, putting GF at a blank face receptacle or a blank face wiring device that's not a receptacle uh, and that feeds the receptacle that your refrigerator is plugged into. So there are ways to get that done and keep everything readily accessible. So don't let that uh, cause you any heartburn or don't lose any sleep over it. All right, so arc fault circuit interrupters had to be uh, readily accessible in the 14 code, and they expanded to kitchens uh, and laundry areas. So they hit kitchens. So this is what we're going to say. We're going to say expansion to kitchens and laundry areas. And what did that do? Nobody knew what a laundry area was, so we had to come up with a definition of a laundry area. You gotta love this stuff. So that was a 14 code was a very significant piece of the history of AFCI protection in a residential dwelling unit. All right, now. And we got expansion to dormitory units in C. All right, so protection of the home run circuit. I wanna spend the last 15 minutes here talking about this 50 foot or 70 foot. So they said, okay, look, you can use an OBC downstream if the branch circuit is continuous from that mold decay circuit breaker to that first outlet, it's continuous. There's no junctions in there, right? The first outlet box has to be marked to indicate it is the first outlet. And why do we do that? Because rough in, right? If you think about the inspection, the inspector said, hey, how am I supposed to know? It's the first outlet, right? So they wanted it marked and they wanted it to be visible. 
so that when you put the sheetrock up, they know, okay, that's the first outlet. This is where the OBC is going to go. And then they said the combination of a multi-case circuit breaker and the OBC AFCI identified as meeting the requirements for a system combination type AFCI listed as such. And like I said, there's only one listed solution on the, um, on the table today uh, for this option. Okay, so 50 and 70 feet. Let's talk about that. That continues, it has to be a continuous run. The first outlet has to be labeled as the first outlet. And for a 14 American wire gauge, it's 50 foot. For a 12 conductor, it is 70 foot. Where did those two numbers come from? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I'm gonna tell you. If you think about the code making process during the 14 cycle, we had, a series of UL reports, Underwriters Laboratories came out with a number of, um, re a bunch of research. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, out of the gates, right? So I, I think that, in my opinion, when I see this many reports that keep correcting errors in previous reports, you have, you have research that they want to bring to the code making process. And remember, you've got two windows of opportunity. You have the first draft meeting and you have the second draft meeting. So, and, and then the sooner they vet and the sooner they circulate, what do we call that, socialize the um, technical documents, the more input you get. So September 30th, 2011 is the first edition, Effectiveness of Circuit Breakers in Mitigating Parallel Arcing Faults in the Home Run Circuit. The premise here is, the thought process is, if you think about this home run circuit, there is a, uh, there is a circuit breaker that is located in this panel board, a multi-case circuit breaker. And what does it have? A multi-case circuit breaker has an instantaneous. And what do we mean by that? Let's get a pen here. If you if I drew a time current curve, you have a thermomagnetic circuit breaker that looks like this. This is the instantaneous region of that molded case circuit breaker. If the arcing current, the damaged conductor, if the arc is high enough, the current values are high enough and trip in this region and cause the circuit breaker to trip in this region, the thought process was that a standard thermomagnetic circuit breaker could provide protection of this home run circuit. But you're depending upon current and you're dependent upon the instantaneous pickup values. Now, one thing to remember that you all, this is a UL489 device. UL489 does not require instantaneous trip functions for a circuit breaker, multi case circuit breaker. So the instantaneous values can vary throughout manufacturers. The arcing faults, the available fault currents can vary. Why or how? The length of the run, the, the available fault current at the panel, that's that panel board at the, at the beginning of that home, that home run circuit, the length of that run, the, uh, the way you create the arc, the carbon, the arc itself, will add impedance, okay? So what UL set out to do in, in a report to say, look, let's look at what can a molded case circuit breaker actually provide from a protection from arcing faults, although it's not listed to do that, right? The only thing that a thermomagnetic circuit breaker is listed to do is protect the conductor from overheating and short circuit protection, not arcing fault protection. But there is a possibility that that multi case circuit breaker could provide some level of protection. And that's what UL set out to analyze and, and, and investigate. So in September, these are the, this is the series of reports. September 30th, 2011, they were released uh, effectiveness of circuit breakers in mitigating parallel arcing faults in the home run. And then on October 4th, they revised it. They, and, and it was a lot of feedback from industry, right? So I know I read through it and other uh, manufacturers and other technical people read through these documents and Code Panel 2 members, I believe, were shared this, this document. There was feedback 
uh, and questions. And then they revised it and came out with another one in October 4th, 2011. And then they came out with another one in January 11th, 2012. Each one correcting and providing more information and more data to the table, making corrections, but also additional research because the research didn't stop. Right. So Dr. Braces put this together and he put it out in, in September. He got feedback. He's continuing to do research based on that feedback. He's getting more circuit breakers. He's testing more devices because what are the key things he's got to figure out? He's got to come up with an equation to calculate the length of conductor. He's got to have an equation that can replicate arcing res impedance values and He's got to figure out what is the third, what is the instantaneous for some of these multi-key circuit breakers? What when do I get into the instantaneous region? And he's got to do all of that. So then he's then he came up with this uh, 50 foot evaluation of run length and available current on breaker ability to mitigate parallel arcing faults, part one. Effect of panel board current for 50 foot run length. So now he's looking at 50 foot. And then Circuit breaker ability to mitigate parallel arcing faults part two effect of run length with 500 amps available at the panel board. Why 500 amps? If you go back to UL 1699, they use 500 amps at the beginning of the brand circuit because test data, okay? They, it's not just the utility. And a lot of people make the big mistake of saying, well, utility fault currents can be higher. Well, sure they can, right? But a panel board, the origin of a branch circuit in a residential dwelling in it doesn't have to be the service equipment, right? It can be a panel board that's downstream. In fact, in my house, I have a panel board down here, which is my service. I have a panel board up in my bedroom, which is for the upstairs. So the origin of the branch circuit for my bedroom circuits does not originate at the service panel board. It originates at a panel board upstairs. That's why it's very clear It's that the code says at the origin of the branch circuit. They don't say use the words service. And the other thing is, is, is these, these reports in many cases are erroneously quoted and used and misrepresented. So uh, if you want a copy of these, let me know, uh, and, or you can contact UL. I believe they probably can provide you. I do have a copy of each of these. And I know that th at least this last one is still up online. I know that's up there. Um, but in any case, um, and I'll show you some of the differences between these reports. So in the, uh, remember two things. One is this equation. That's an important piece of the puzzle. The other is the instantaneous pickup of circuit breakers. The very first report, September 30th, this was the equation for the length. So you'll see rho sub L, which is an impedance value. L is the length. And then you have the voltage that's being applied. I magnetic, which is the, magnetic trip of the circuit breaker. This was the original equation. And the circuit breaker age did have a significant role. This is quoted right out of that report um, with a trip level with new breakers showing a nominal distribution with mean of 212 amps and 99% of all circuit breakers having a magnetic trip at or below 300 amps. So you would say, I, and I, that's why I put 212 to 300 was sort of the range for the instantaneous pickup of a molded case circuit breaker based upon their research. And what they did was they went to your big box and they bought them and then they put current through them to determine when they go instantaneously. <clears throat> and they grabbed a sampling from each manufacturer. Then in October 4th, you'll notice the equation stays the same, but now we went from 213, 212 to 213, probably a transposition here, I don't know. New circuit breakers show an average magnetic trip level of 213 with a standard deviation of 33.2. This suggests that 99% of all circuit breakers will possess a magnetic trip level at or below 300 amps. This is true for all brands of circuit breakers investigated in the work. So UL did, it looks like they probably added a few more breakers and made a little adjustment to the number. The next report was January 11th of 2012. This was right before the first draft meeting. So this was the data that code making panel two uh, was able to view. And, and there's your equation, but look, they added, look at the difference. It went from rho sub L times L is less than 0.4 times VRMS over IMAG to rho sub L times L is less than VRMS over two times the, uh, the 
the larger uh, action uh, or the, the, the a, a, lar a larger equation, 0.8 over IMAG, and that 8.8, .8, they're they're looking at what the um, uh, what is an arcing current value? Is it you know is it the, the bolted fault? Is it at eighty percent? What not? And then one over IPSSC. Now this is the available fault current. So the previous edition didn't take the, into consideration the available fault current at the source, and that was the error that was corrected in between these two editions. They said, oh well, you know we've got to think about that source current, and the magnetic trip. So then then they did more research, and it says fifteen amps. The range for instantaneous was 278 to 299. A 20-amp breaker was 202 to 314. And this is what they said. Uh, new circuit breakers uh, show magnetic trip levels that are normally distributed around the average of 213 amps and a standard deviation of 33. 95% of all 15-amp residential circuit breakers will instantaneous trip at or above 278 amps. And 99% of all circuit breakers will magnetically trip at above 299. That's a 15-amp. 20 amp circuit breakers showed a mean value of 202, with 95% of all 20 amp residential breakers instantaneously tripping at or above 314 amps, and 99% of circuit breakers magnetically tripping at or above 349 amps. So now he did more data and more research. He tested more breakers. And, he, and, and now the, the instantaneous values are getting a little bit higher. <coughs> now, this is the data that Code Panel 2 had in the first draft meeting. Now, in between the first draft and the second draft, UL updated their report again, January 11th, 2012. Now that 350 to 400 amps is now the instantaneous pickup. And they said these revised values show that the magnetic trip level of circuit breakers is not as well controlled as was previously found in a previous study, which was what we looked at before. The new data suggests that the 99th percentile upper bound may need to increase to at least 350 amps, perhaps as high as 400 amps. Although though this may suggest that for the application discussed in this work, circuit breakers with a known magnetic trip may be required. And we're still having this debate at Code Making Panel 2, recognizing that, look, circuit breaker instantaneous values, A, they're not required by UL-489 at all, and, oh, by the way, manufacturers will make a high magnetic breaker and maybe sell those in the same distributors or big box locations, uh, or maybe they, they send high mags to certain areas of the country outside of other areas of the country. Uh, why? Because we, you know, you've got to think about temperature correction. You got to think about uh, maybe uh, for motor loads and different types of applications. You have, you need a higher uh, threshold for instantaneous. Okay, the second draft meetings were, were uh, September twenty eighth. So this came out right before the second draft. Look at the equation now. The equation went and got bigger. Right, so now we have an RC over, so now we're starting to recognize, okay, there's an impedance value to these arcs as well. And Dr. Brasis expanded his testing and his data collection. So he, he, he did a lot of work uh, on, on, on his research, changed the equations, and this is, um, now it's 400 to 450 is the circuit breaker instantaneous. And it says the initial set of circuit breakers, which were sampled from, from four North American manufacturers and included circuit breakers of different designs for each manufacturer, suggested that 99% of all circuit breakers would magnetically trip at or below 300 amps for 15 amp circuit breakers and 350 amps for 20 amp circuit breakers. That was that previous report. However, follow-up testing one year later negated these findings, which with circuit breakers of the same model number, but of a different batch had significantly different magnetic trip levels varying by 50 amps or more for some manufacturers, yet unvarying for others. These results showed that magnetic trip levels could conceivably be controlled, but were not in all cases. The revised data showed that panel board current and run length would need to be set assuming magnetic trip thresholds as high as 400 to 450 amps would be needed which makes arc mitigation using magnetic trip levels not specifically calibrated for this application impractical as well as potentially unreliable. So this was the final report that was available 
at, for the second draft meetings. The equation changed and the data due to more research on instantaneous pickup values, which again is not required by UL 489 at all, because we do make some circuit breakers that, uh, that, that have very high magnetic pickups. We wanna be very flexible in that, in that range and each manufacturer is a little different. So this is the equation. Okay, these are the parameters. You can pause this and, and read through this, but R rho sub L is the resistance per linear foot of your cable. The L is the length. The voltage is the supply voltage. The RC is the series contact resistance at the point of contact arcing, which was what he added, Dr. Braces added to the equation. IP, uh, IPSEC, I. PSSC is the short circuit current at the panel board. And then IMAG was the magnetic, the instantaneous trip for each for the circuit breaker. All right, so these are the values uh, that UL, that the UL research for a number for a 12, number 12, we have 0 0.1588 for the for Verro sub L. Uh, and for a copper conductor, 0 0.002523. If you want to know how, how these I have a, a whole nother paper, which I'm thinking of writing an article on it, but you may find it in IEI News Live, you never know, or IEI Magazine uh, in the future, uh, but I'll explain, I, I can explain and provide you that information. Uh, 120, 30 milliohms is that uh, R sub C, and then IPSCC, uh, 500 amps is basically what UL1699 tests. Uh, all of these AFCI's devices too, so 500 amps at the origin of the branch circuit, not necessarily uh, does that mean it is the service, could be anywhere in, in the uh, power distribution system, wherever a branch circuit begins. And then 300 amps is what CMP2 accepted. And if you go back to the report on proposals, this is in the first draft meeting, they accepted 300 amps at the uh, source of the branch circuit for the, or, I'm sorry, 300 amps uh, for the instantaneous pickup of the molded case circuit breaker, all right? So, <clears throat> when I plug the data in for, for in that equation, I get 15 and a half feet. I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. I should be getting 50 or 70 feet, right? Um, but remember, if you think back, this equation, was what was used in the first draft. They never changed the lengths. They never changed or adjusted anything in the second draft. So all of the data, all of the, the lengths that, that we see are not based upon the latest addition, which would have been this equation. They were based on this equation, but I'll tell you, to be honest, I put the data in, 500 amps available at the panel board, 300 amp instantaneous and everything else in this equation, and I still came out with different numbers. So I don't know where the technical error is, but there is definitely a technical error somewhere in there um, for the lengths. But the lengths are the lengths are the lengths. These are all the equations. This is how uh, the, the panel came up with their decisions and That's all I have to say about that. So that was the 2014 edition, and we haven't changed that since. Okay, those numbers are still the same. The, the, the parameters are still the same. The 50 and 70 feet are still there, all that good stuff. Um, so none of that changed, and that's the origin of those links for the 14 edition of the code. And if you wanna do the math, you can do the math, and if you need more information, give me a call, and I will let you know. All right, so. In the 17 code, we expanded to bathrooms and dormitory units. And we also expanded 210.12c for guest rooms and guest suites of hotels and motels. That's what happened in the 17 code. So bathrooms were added to dormitory units. It didn't get added to 210.12a for a lot of different reasons. And if you recall, there's a lot of debate on 210.12a with regard to expansion and all that good stuff. And sometimes you throw the baby out with the bathwater. But we didn't uh, have those same arguments in dormitory units, so bathrooms made it in there. And then in the 2020 code, we expanded again to patient sleeping rooms and nursing homes and limited care facilities. 
And then we uh, ad adjusted the branch circuit extensions or modifications to address dormitory units and guest rooms and guest suites. And then in the 2023 code, you're going to see a reorganization and some clarity added to 210.12. We got rid of keep, we kind of keep saying arc fault circuit interrupter and just replace it with the acronym AFCI. Thank God. Um, we added a new exception for arc welding equipment because we were going to get expansion to garages. We, you know, garages, bathrooms, and a few other areas were in attics or something like that we're looking at. And it looked like that was going through. We needed an exception for arc welding equipment for a while just to work through any compatibility issues. We never got the expansion into, into the garages, but we kept the exception. So you got an exception that's really not useful. We added 10 amp circuits because of uh, the uh, copper clad aluminum's effort around 10 amp circuits. And, and there are 10 amp circuits and you could use uh, uh, copper clad aluminum for lighting, but you can't use them on a receptacle. So we didn't need to worry about the links uh, for a receptacle outlet uh, type OBC AFCI at the, at the first outlet because you're not allowed to put a 10 amp um, a circuit on a outlet, a receptacle outlet. You could put it for lighting and, and, and other things like that, but you just can't. We don't have a 10 amp receptacle. End of story. Uh, and they also expanded to fire stations, police stations, ambulance stations, rescue stations, ranger stations, and similar locations. And they're looking at uh, where they're used exclusively as sleeping quarters. And that's what they're doing in the 2023 code cycle. And that, I believe, completes the fundamentals of AFCIs in the National Electrical Code. And I hope you got something out of this session. And I hope that, uh, and if there's any, if you have any questions, please use the chat. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, this is a recorded session. I didn't say that up front. This is a recorded session. And um, I'm in the air right now. So I'm not able to um, monitor the chats. Please be mindful of that. Um, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Same bad time, same bad channel, right here, AFCI, or I, IAEI News Live, Tuesday at 12 o'clock next week. So thanks for what you do for the electrical industry. Thanks for what you do for electrical safety. Thanks for tuning in, and I really appreciate all of you watching and subscribing to this channel. So don't forget to subscribe, hit that bell, and we will see you next week. Take care, stay safe, God bless, and please stay healthy.